Hi, this is Chani from Oregon, and you're listening to Kimberly Graham on Two Broads Talking Politics. Hey everyone, welcome back to Two Broads Talking Politics. As usual, I'm one of your co-hosts, Sophie, and I'm here with your other co-host, Kelly. Hey, Kelly. Hey, Sophie. And joining us today is Kimberly Graham. She is running for U.S. Senate from Iowa. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. So let's start off just by talking about you a little bit. Can you tell our listeners about who you are and kind of the story of how you came to be running for Senate? Yes. So, of course, there's a lot of different puzzle pieces that come together to uh, result in me deciding to run for U.S. Senate. But in a nutshell, like so many other people, after the 2016 election, I looked around and said, nope, (laughs) I don't (laughs) like what's happening. And uh, I would like to be part of making things different and better. And another puzzle piece of that was that I was a single mom since my son was about seven years old. And so, and I never thought about running for office, like I think a lot of candidates uh, nowadays, increasingly so. Uh, It was never something I aspired to. It was never something I intended to do. And I kind of just had my head down for a lot of years, making ends meet in a single income household and raising my son. And my son is now 19. So after the 2016 elections, he was getting toward adulthood. So that also made me think, well, maybe I will have the time. I just have the one, the one child, so maybe I'll have the time to spend running for office or trying to make some kind of positive difference. I found out about the Ready to Run program at the Cat Center for Women in Politics in Ames, Iowa, and I went to their three-day kind of boot camp in early 2017, along with a lot of other women who've now gone on to really make their mark in Iowa politics. And then I started looking around at what offices might be possible and started looking at Senator Ernst and what she was doing and not doing for the people of our state and for the country and decided that that might be a place where my life experience and my career and my skills might be well used. So a couple of years ago, I started making plans to perhaps run for that office and just feel like Middle and low income people are not represented in Congress. Um, I felt that way for a long time, but with all of the other factors combining together, I think those are the main things that made me think, yeah, this is this is something that I want to do. I want to take a stand for average people that don't have a lot of money and resources, and so that's what I want to do. Iowa seems so interesting politically. You know, I, I think we sort of thought of it as a blue state and then purple and then it was going red. And, and, and now, you know, there were uh, three districts went blue in the 2018 congressional <laughs> race. So what mm-hmm. what is your sense of sort of what the people of Iowa are, are thinking and feeling about politics right now, about their, their needs, uh, you know, and sort of their everyday lives? Yes, Iowa is extremely interesting that way. And I... I Well, of course, as a progressive Democrat, you know, my first instinct is, you know, yes, it would be great if everyone were progressive Democrats. But I know that isn't that isn't reality. And I find it actually really more interesting to live in a state that is pretty evenly divided as far as the number of Republican voter registrations and Democrat and independents. There's a huge number of independent registered voters here in this state. And. As you all well know, I'm sure whoever's listening and you two know, this state went for President Obama twice and then, you know, majority voted for the current president in the 2016 election. And that's a whole, you know, 12 hour discussion on why that (laughs) happened. And, And lots of other people have discussed it before me and I won't get into it. But fundamentally, I find the people of Iowa to be hurting financially. I find them to be feeling not listened to by you know, either party. And so to me, my interpretation, my high level interpretation, there's always more to it than this, but they gave President Obama a chance. They gave him another chance. <laughs> they still didn't find their lives improving. 
So they thought, let's give this guy a chance. He's a super successful businessman. And that's arguable, of course. I don't believe he is a super successful businessman. But that was what he that that was the con job he did. And I don't really fault people who get conned by an expert con man. I fault the con man. So, uh, you know, I think people thought maybe this guy will help us. And and clearly this guy hasn't helped us. So I think that's kind of where most Iowans are landing. They're, they're, I, I find them really open to other ideas because clearly what we've been doing hasn't worked. Speaking of how this guy has not helped us, I you are actually, as Iowans, my neighbors to the southwest. I live in Wisconsin. And here in Wisconsin, uh, we have a lot of farms, as I imagine you also have in Iowa. Uh, mm-hmm. Down up here, they're, they're mostly dairy farms. But right. we are, a lot of our agricultural sector is suffering under and worried about the tariffs that the president has started a trade war with China and now apparently tried to start a trade war with Mexico. Uh, the jury's out on whether or not that's actually happening but it, it's really affected farmers in Wisconsin uh, very heavily and has mm-hmm. been really destructive to one of our largest um, economic sectors. So I'm wondering if you mm-hmm. can talk a little bit about whether those tariffs have been similarly painful for Iowa. They've been absolutely devastating for Iowa. And I think that's yet another reason why Iowans are looking for other options besides what the GOP believes is helpful, (laughs) because clearly it's been devastating. I mean, everything from an increase, as as I know you've seen in Wisconsin, I've read lots of articles about what's going on in Wisconsin with dairy farming. I think uh, in some ways you are experiencing in Wisconsin on an even higher level, but we're definitely feeling it here just as badly. And that is an increase in farmer suicides, an increase mm-hmm. in calls to suicide hotlines, people calling their representative and saying, maybe my family would be better off without me because I'm worth, I'm worth far more dead than alive. I mean, this is absolutely just devastating. When people feel hopeless about their financial future, then they, they feel hopeless about everything. I mean, and that makes sense. You know, this trade war, trade war is absolutely devastating. And unfortunately, our junior senator <laughs> sort of the best we can get out of her in support of Iowa's farmers is, well, you know, it's not. Yes, it's it's very damaging. And oh, and the oh, and the president needs to stop that. <laughs> I mean, that's the most that's kind of the most strong statement. I'm you know paraphrasing, of course, but that's the strongest statement and, and assistance that she's providing our farmers. And it's not enough by a long shot. And you know, decrease in farmers even being able to get loans now, you know, banks that used to loan them money. Now we're saying, no, no more, because the the forecast is too poor, you know, for for your Mm -hmm. for your farm's future, we're not going to loan you any more money. And there's between that and the flooding, the absolutely devastating flooding we've had in the state, with really no signs of that letting up. I was, (laughs) I was telling a a farmer that I was speaking with down in, in Red Oak, which is actually where our junior senators from. I was down there at a Democrat uh, party picnic down there last week, talking to a lot of people, a lot of farmers. And, you know, one, we were talking about that he's become an accidental hydroponic farmer as a, you know, joke, (laughs) you know, kind of, kind of doing gallows humor there. You know, it's not funny, but it was the point being, you know, all of these farms are underwater. They're absolutely underwater. You can't plant in that. You can't harvest in that. You can't grow anything in that. And they're now trying to decide, do they just take the prevented planting insurance or do they take bailout money or can they take, they're trying to navigate what they can do to provide any kind of financial relief. But I will also say that the the bailouts, I'm using air quotes, you can't see me, but I'm using air quotes, the bailouts that farmers are, are getting from this administration for the vast majority of farmers are meaningless. They're, they're amounts of like $25, a hundred dollars. It's, it's, an, it's a rare farm that's getting a 10 or $20,000 check even. Mm-hmm. So it, 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 these bailouts are mainly, in my opinion, mostly a political stunt for the majority of Iowa farmers and are not actually even helpful. 
So I wanted to ask what it's like to be running for a, an office other than president in a presidential election cycle in Iowa, <laughs> because, uh-huh. you know, we're, we're seeing tons and tons of events going on all over Iowa. I was joking over the weekend. I think I'm just going to pack my kids in the car and drive to Iowa for a couple of days and see how many <laughs> presidential candidates I trip over. Uh, but, you know, is it is it helpful? Is it difficult to get traction? What What is that balance sort of look like when everyone is so focused on the the presidential election? Yes, I think it's incredibly helpful. Uh, You know, as as I'm a first time candidate, I have never run for anything in my life. And I'm finding it extremely helpful because people are there, you know, their ears are kind of perked up about politics right now. Because as you said, you cannot you know, throw a rock and not hit a presidential candidate. That's my bad analogy. We don't want to hit them with anything, but you know, you can't, even, you can't avoid them pretty much, you, uh, you know, and it's great because it's really caused, created a lot of energy and interest around politics and not just the presidential race. I was in Cresco, which is way up. I joked. It's like near Canada. It's the way the way Northeast corner of Iowa I was there Saturday for a District 1 event called Passport to Victory, which that district uh, is putting on three of those events over the summer. Great event, about 400 people in attendance, and they are inviting every presidential candidate. But that particular one, uh, Amy Klobuchar spoke, excuse me, Pete Buttigieg, Governor Hickenlooper, and Mayor de Blasio. I believe that's all. I probably forgot somebody now, and I'm going to get... (laughs) <laughs> but I believe those were the, the presidential candidates that spoke. And then I got to speak in between, I believe, Amy Klobuchar and Bill de Blasio. So, you know, to speak right between those presidential candidates and have 10 minutes to get to know those 400 people in attendance who are very interested. I mean, these are mostly Democrats who are, you know, attending this event and they're very interested in hearing from uh, what currently are the three candidates for United States Senate to replace Joni Ernst, that was an incredible opportunity, you know, that I would never have had if this weren't a presidential year. So I, I think overall, I think it's, it's a great opportunity for down-ballot candidates to be, to be able to get their message out. We talked a little bit about the tariffs. What are some of the other issues that people in Iowa are bringing up as you're sort of hitting the campaign trail and, and meeting voters? The number one issue far and away is the medical crisis, medical insurance crisis, medical provision crisis, whatever you want to call it. And personally, almost to a person, everyone I speak with says they want Medicare for all or some, you know, some very similar system to that, whether it's precisely that, you know, sometimes they don't know or, or but they want They want something a lot more similar to what every other developed nation in the world has, which is making sure that private insurance is not controlling the provision of medical services and and isn't controlling the premium prices, basically. That is the most important issue. You know, right behind that and very related is prescription costs. You know, we all know that people are dying around this country quite literally because the insulin is so expensive that they're rationing it, you know, trying to make it last longer. And I don't even I can never find the actual right word. There are no words for how unethical, amoral and appalling that is to me in this nation with which is arguably and I'll tell you why I say arguably the most wealthy nation on Earth. That is just unconscionable to me. And I say arguably because, you know, let's say we just talk about the top 10 percent. Forty years ago, you know, r- roughly the top 10 percent controlled about one third of all the wealth in this nation. And now the top 10 percent control roughly 75 percent of the wealth in this nation. So if you subtract that number from the wealth in this nation, are we the wealthiest, wealthiest nation on Earth? I mean, we may be in absolute terms. Do Americans control most of the wealth? Yes. But do most Americans control most of the wealth? Absolutely not. And I don't understand why that can't be. I don't understand why in this country, every single human being cannot have a life of dignity that includes no worries about their medical care, no worries about prescriptions, no worries about their basic ability to literally survive physically in this country. And that's why that's my number one issue when I'm campaigning is, and I think as far as I know so far, I'm the only of the three candidates who are strongly 
unapologetically advocating for that, for Medicare for All or a similar program. (laughs) When I watched the documentary uh, From Paris to Pittsburgh about uh, climate change and and reactions to climate change in this country, uh, one of the things that really struck me was how a lot of the farmers in Iowa and uh, a lot of the farms in Iowa are really using green technology or maybe converting some of their land to things like wind farms and, and solar panels. What are you hearing and and thinking about uh, climate change and and the way that Iowa can really be sort of uh, at the forefront of of moving to green energy? Yes. So we are, last I knew, number two in the United States in wind energy. We, you know, I think Texas, I believe, is number one. And I would like to see us become number one in wind energy. My little fun fact, my son's father is an an IBEW union commercial industrial electrician, and he has personally wired up a lot of the wind, a lot of the windmills in this state. So I know for a fact personally that those, those windmills don't only produce green energy, they produce some well-paid jobs, not only when we first wire them up, but to maintain them. You know, the, the, te- the tech people that go and maintain them when they have issues down the road, that is a growing field as well that people can be trained in. The other thing that I want to just mention about sustainable farming and green technologies is that we're also seeing an increase in, and we want to incentivize farmers to create more wetlands, which will help clean up the water and also help preserve our topsoil. Another major issue that we have here in Iowa with climate, with the climate crisis is, and Iowa farmers know this, but it's not, it's not talked about a lot just in general yet is our beautiful, rich black topsoil here in Iowa that makes us such a rich state for agriculture is literally going down to the Gulf of Mexico. Our topsoil is literally being washed down, down the rivers, to the Gulf of Mexico. And it's going to be a matter of time if we cannot mitigate that and stop that from happening, that we're going to, we're going to become a less and less productive state agriculturally. So things like increasing the wetlands will help that and, and other things. And also we can incentivize farmers to sequester carbon uh, because when they're tilling and so forth, that brings it up. There's ways to capture that. And those are green technologies that either are already exist or are being developed that we can really make a major dent in, in the climate crisis with things like that as well. But we need to help a lot of farmers do that better because some of those technologies are really easy, easier than others, and some are more affordable than others. And some are unaffordable to a small or, you know, small, medium-sized farm. You know, rather than <laughs> rather than giving some more tax breaks to, you know, Amazon or whatever, or the very wealthy, we should be using some of those dollars to incentivize farmers to be able to ad- address the climate crisis because they sure want to. They know that their living depends on the health of the land. And, you know, I find farmers to really be very concerned about that and at the forefront of that. Is there anything else you want to make sure that we talk about, Kimberly? I just want to make sure that that people understand why I'm doing this. My current main employment is I am the attorney and guardian ad litem for abused and neglected children in a recovery court program who are the the children of participants in a recovery court recovery court program and I've spent my 20 years as an attorney the majority of that time advocating for real people that need real problems solved usually people in poverty not always but that's been the bulk of who I have worked for and with and I deal with the end I deal with the lack of Medicare for all. I deal with the lack of investments in public education. I deal with the lack of available drug treatment. I deal with the lack of universal daycare, which keeps so many people in the lower middle income from being able to work because the cost of daycare is crushing them combined with the cost of any medical insurance they may be lucky enough to try to to have. And oh, and the low minimum wage. You know, a lot of the people I work with don't have a lot of education and they're not going to do a whole lot better than a minimum wage job. And I've compared our minimum wage in dollars to the minimum wage of Canada, France, Germany, the UK. Compare it to anyone. We are failing. We are a good $4 an hour below, you know, the next lowest minimum wage in this, the wealthiest nation on earth, (laughs) so-called. So, 
it's just unconscionable to me. And I, I just believe that people like me are vastly underrepresented in Congress. And a couple of months into my campaign, I know why. Because this takes a lot of money and a lot of time. And most working people don't have a lot of money and a lot of time. Now, I don't have a lot of money and I don't have a lot of time. I still have to work while I'm running this U.S. Senate campaign because <laughs> I don't have anyone else paying my bills. But I, I can make enough time, I think, to run a competitive race. And if enough people get behind this campaign, I don't believe that it's out of the realm of possibility that we can win and that we can win in November of 2020, because I think Iowans are tired of a bunch of lip service and nobody who actually knows what it's like, as I do, to choose between your mortgage payment and your medical insurance premiums and only be able to pay one and have to wait to pay the other because you just don't have that kind of money. (laughs) So if, if our listeners would like to get behind your campaign to find out more about you or to maybe donate or volunteer for your campaign, how can they do that? Yes. So we have – so everything is pretty much universally Kimberly for Iowa. So Twitter is Kimberly for Iowa. Facebook, Kimberly for Iowa is the Facebook page. The website is KimberlyForIowa.com. So you can find out more information about the campaign there and find links to donate through our Act Blue account there. And we would just appreciate anybody either donating or donating your time, getting involved. We have tons of opportunities for lots of people. We've got a little good core of intrepid volunteers so far, and we can always use more because we don't have a lot of money in this campaign because we are not well connected to industry or business. I've been connected to sort of real working people in my career, and that's about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't have those connections to a lot of money that a lot that the other people in this race may have. So. This is definitely a people-powered campaign, and we appreciate every cent that anybody can contribute and any time that anyone can contribute. Well, we'll definitely put links to those in our show notes so that our listeners can uh, learn more about you and hopefully send some money your way. Great. you. Well, thank you so, so much. It's been such a great opportunity to talk with you, and I love your podcast. I've listened to several episodes, <laughs> and they're, just, they're, they're great. I was so excited to find out that you guys existed. I'm ashamed to say I didn't know until maybe a month ago that you existed, but I'm catching up on all your episodes now. So. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you for joining us. It was really great to talk to you, and good luck with your campaign, and we'll be, we'll be following you. Thanks for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Immunuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wethlin and was created for use by this podcast.